Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with another COVID update. Um, not in the ER this time, uh, at the office this week. I have to say the ER has been really tough the last um, month or so. Just so many sick COVID patients and everything else. Good news is, though, our numbers are starting to drop. Um, if you look behind me, these are the numbers in North Carolina. Currently, we have three, almost 3,100 people hospitalized. But on the 9th or 10th of the month, we had 3,800. Now that, you know, at the beginning of the summer, we had 800, so it's still quite a few people, but we're starting to see those numbers drop. You know, that translates in the emergency room from wait times of 17 hours to maybe eight, to eight wait times of eight or nine or 10 hours. So still not great. I'm still seeing overwhelmingly unvaccinated people, a lot of younger people, a lot of them very, very sick, um, have seen a lot of death, unfortunately. Um, I remember those deaths lagged the cases because very often people don't die until weeks after they kind of get admitted to the hospital. I thought though we would talk a little bit about what we're doing to treat COVID because there's a lot of controversy about ivermectin and other things. A lot of people have sent me questions about monoclonal antibodies. And so what is out there that has been proven to be effective um, for treatment of COVID either as an outpatient or even as an inpatient inside the hospital? So they kind of fall into three major categories. One of those are antiviral medicines. And we've tried all types of antiviral medicines against COVID without much um, success. The one that we're using in the hospital is remdesivir, which has been shown to you know, improve uh, survival and, and potentially lower some deaths in, in the hospital. Um, it's given IV inside the hospital. There are mixed signals about remdesivir, whether or not it's, it's helpful or not, um, but it is sort of a mainstay of treatment um, and there are studies ongoing. Um, it's not a perfect drug by any means. It's not a cure by any means. Um, other antivirals that have been proposed are ivermectin, which we've heard lots and lots about. Lots of different studies um, done on ivermectin and a lot of social media nonsense on, about ivermectin. And I've, you know, I've treated people with ivermectin. Have I been very impressed with its, its utility? Not really. Um, I have not really seen a, a huge effect from ivermectin um, in patients that I've used it on. Still had people admitted to the hospital. We've had plenty of people in the ER who have been treated with ivermectin as an outpatient that still ended up getting admitted, still got, ended up getting intubated, still ended up dying. Um, the studies are really not very good. Most of the studies that are quoted are very small. They're plagued with problems. And the only, the very few larger studies have shown mo no benefit. So, and now we're starting to see problems with people getting sick, taking, you know, ivermectin from the feed store, which is dangerous. So, you know, the prescription of ivermectin is fairly safe if prescribed in the correct dosage. You know, taking horse ivermectin is not a good idea by any means. Azithromycin is an antibiotic that early on we thought maybe along with hydroxychloroquine might be effective. Um, and basically the, the studies that have been done with azithromycin have not shown any significant benefit. The next kind of class of medicines are anti-inflammatories. And those are things like steroids that reduce inflammation. We know, we've heard about the cytokine storm that causes people to get very, very ill with COVID. And we know that IV steroids have been shown to be fairly beneficial with admitted patients. Um, Again, data is a little bit mixed. It's not a, a cure by any means, but th generally they've been shown to be beneficial for admitted inpatient hospitalized patients. Not so much for people who are outpatients. So oral steroids have not really been proven to be all that effective. And so it's not typically, we're not typically giving people oral steroids because it really hasn't shown effectiveness. Another one is hydroxychloroquine. We remember we talked about that a lot early in, you know, that was the, the, the before ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine was the one that all the Facebook groups were talking about. And it's a, a, a medicine used for malaria and for autoimmune diseases. And at this point, we've done a lot, we've had lots of studies that have shown essentially not really any benefit from hydroxychloroquine. The, the large randomly controlled trials have not shown any significant benefit. One of them um, you know, showed potential harm, and um, one also showed increased use of uh, needing for need for hospitalized patients to be ventilated end up in the ICU with hydroxychloroquine so hydroxychloroquine has been really proven not to be effective um, throughout the the pandemic the next class are monoclonal antibodies and antibody therapies are the idea that we have you know either manufactured or possibly convalescent plasma where we're using um, plasma from people who have had COVID have, who presumably may have antibodies against the spike protein and against the virus itself, infusing those into people and using that as a treatment. And convalescent plasma we used, you know, to some extent early on 
but haven't really gotten great results. And so now we've got these monoclonal antibodies and there's a, there's a variety of them that are out there that have emergency use, use authorizations that are basically manufactured antibodies against typically the spike protein of the virus. And we're, you know, some randomly controlled trials, you know, well done studies have shown reduced hospitalization and reduced deaths in people that are or at high risk that receive those treatments early on as an outpatient before they were admitted to the hospital. Subsequent studies have shown that giving it to people who are sick enough to be in the hospital hasn't really been very effective. And we're not typically using monoclonal therapies as inpatients, but we are using them as outpatients. And we're, we're using it more and more. We have infusion centers set up at our hospital now where we can send those people out. It's a bit problematic in the emergency department because the whole process takes about three or four hours. And if I've got 50 people waiting in the waiting room and they're waiting 10 or 12 hours, taking up a room for three or four hours is very problematic for me because there are sick people out in the waiting room that I need to take care of. But now we can send these people you know, the next day to the outpatient infusion center and get those. And they've changed the criteria a little bit. So what are the criteria? What are the high risk criteria for monoclonal antibodies? Well, typically age over 65 is one of them. Originally BMI above 30, which is the definition of obesity, but the CDC's moved that down to a BMI over 25. And given the obesity rate in this country, that pretty much includes almost everybody. Um, also diabetes, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, immunocompromise of any uh, way, um, chronic lung disease, what else, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, neurodegener uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. So people that have neurodevelopmental children uh, that have neurodevelopmental disorders when they're growing up are eligible, as well as people that have implanted medical devices like a trach or, or certain other devices. So the, the capability or the, the eligibility group that for monoclonals is actually pretty large and we're using them and I'm at recommending them for patients that I'm seeing that are, are at high risk and are moderately sick. Um, if people just come in with a positive test, I'm not typically recommending you get monoclonal because it's it's difficult to arrange it and um, you know I think that those things are better reserved for people who are actually having symptoms and are, are pretty sick. And so generally people that are having significant symptoms um, that I'm concerned are gonna convert to a hospitalized patient or someone that might be at risk of death, we're recommending um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, I have had a few people that have, have been less, you know, less severely ill but are pregnant. You know, I think that those people are pretty reasonable. The, the treatments are safe. They're they're given via an IV in a supervised setting uh, over the course of a couple hours, and um, you know, we're we're seeing relatively good results. It's none of these things are cures. So you know, basically, our treatment for COVID has not, you know, it's, we we don't have any magic bullets the best thing to do is to not get it. And you know, the, you know, the, the best way to prevent yourself from dying or from ending up in the hospital is get immunized because we know that those immunizations reduce those risks 95 plus percent. Um, if you don't wanna get immunized, that's your prerogative, but then you need to mask, you need to distance, you need to do everything you can to not get exposed because Delta is very, very contagious. Remember, it's a novel virus. We've never seen it before. You get exposed, you're getting sick. Your immune system does not know what to do with this virus, so you're not going to be naturally immune. And I have people that keep talking to me about natural immunity is better. Well, remember, I agree, natural immunity is probably better. However, you have to get sick with COVID to develop natural immunity. You can't get natural immunity without getting sick. And then you're rolling the dice with everybody else. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Galvin. I'm a board certified emergency doctor. I've been taking care of COVID patients since the beginning of this. Uh, as usual, get immunized, wear a mask, look out for yourselves, your families, and those around you. I'll be back soon with another update.